Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Father, we thank you again for a chance to study your word. We're thankful for the peace we have in this country right now, where we reflect on the events in Haiti, and uh, we ask that you would provide for everyone down there. We think especially of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and ask that you would strengthen their faith, that in the midst of this chaos, they would be examples of what it means to trust you for all things. We pray that you would use this uh, event to draw more people to yourself. On a day where, we, where most of the nation pauses to remember uh, the civil rights movement, we are thankful that in Christ we are all accepted. That the uh, racial divisions and disunity that are present in this world, in Christ, they evaporate. Everyone comes to you on the same playing field. Your son died to save people from every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. And in eternity, all will be represented there. And we look forward with great expectation to that day. There are many evils in this world. This is one of them. We look forward to the day when they will all be wiped out. To that end, Father, we pray you would help us to be sensitive to be aware of difficulties around us, and give us even more hope for the day when you will set all things right. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we left Israel, camped in Kadesh Barnea at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 1, and the Moses tells us in verse 46, you remained in Kadesh many days. It was a long time. Israel's not going to leave Kadesh Barnea until the second year after the Exodus. They're camped there because of their refusal to enter the land. And we argued last time that they did this as an example of disobedience and in the final analysis, unbelief. They did not want to trust God when he said, you should go into the land, I'll take care of you. And so they stay there for all those extra days. It's interesting, I mean, you wonder what it's like to be there, right on the doorstep of the promised land. God told you to go in, you said no, you had regrets, you tried to go in, your enemies defeated you, and now you have to sit there and wait and watch. It's like a parent. No, you can't have that. And you take it from one end of the table, and you don't put it away, you put it right on the other end of the table. And now the child has to sit there. What could have been? Oh, what could have been? I could have gone into the land. I've got to sit here. And finally, chapter 2 opens, verse 1, Then we turned and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and we circled Mount Seir for many days. That, right there, is an understatement. Many days turns out to be decades. They're wandering in this wilderness, and Moses disposes of that whole wilderness wandering in a verse. And because of your survey of Old Testament history, you remember all those, those trials, those, those examples of disobedience and dissatisfaction with the Lord in the book of Numbers all get squished into that verse. They're wandering, they're disobeying. What happened at Kadesh Barnea was simply emblematic of the character of this nation. They're like this from the beginning. And all through those 40 years, they're complainers. Moses doesn't go into it. Ideally, this generation has been the beneficiary of all that complaining. Think about it. These, these were people who were young at Kadesh Barnea. And they've sort of spent their life for the last 40 years. They've spent 40 years of their lives wandering around in the desert. Sometimes people think if you spend an extra year in college, you've wasted something. 
students will say, well, I don't want to stay an extra year. Why? I don't, I don't want to waste anything. That's one year, 10 months of serious study. Imagine 40 years wandering around in the desert. That couldn't have been good for interfamily relations. Hey, Dad, I'm getting old here. When I heard about these promises a long time ago, why? Oh, that's right. You guys didn't want to go into the land. And, oh, man, now I'm out here in this desert because of you. Yes, God was providing for them. Yes, they were learning things they needed to learn. But you have to imagine those were difficult, difficult times. And so finally, in verse 2, the Lord spoke to me, Moses says, saying, verse 3, you have circled this mountain long enough. Turn north and command the people, saying, You will pass through the territory of your brothers, the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not provoke them, for I will not give you any of their land, even as little as a footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money, so that you may eat. And you shall also purchase water from them with money so that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all that you have done. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have not lacked a thing. So after wandering around, now it's time to head out of the wilderness and into the Transjordan area. The other side of the Jordan River. The first time Israel tries to go in, it's through the south. This time, they're going to come in from the east and head west across the Jordan River. But to get there, they have to pass through the territory of some other nations. These nations were not like the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Hittites who lived in the land. These were brother nations, Esau, Moab, and Ammon. And you should know the history, the descent of these nations. Esau is the brother of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. You remember the split? Jacob uh, and Esau are twins. And Jacob comes out holding on to Esau's heel. And this is going to illustrate the difficult relationship they have with one another. Jacob's going to swindle, as it were, Esau out of his birthright. And then he's going to steal the blessing. And then he's going to have to get out of Dodge because Esau wants to kill him. When, Esau, when Jacob comes back, the relationship seems to have been patched up. Esau and his descendants have settled down here south of the Zered River. And they seem happy enough. And by the time Israel comes out of Egypt, they're a nation unto themselves with kings and princes and a thriving society right down here in Edom. And so... When Israel comes out of Egypt, you can expect the Edomites are going to sit there and say, hey, I've heard of this people before. These Israelites that, that, whoa, they escaped from Egypt. God destroyed all the Egyptians. They're coming near my territory. We're going to fight. We have to protect ourselves. And God tells Israel, it's interesting, you're my chosen people. I love you and I have land prepared for you, but it's not this land. This is Edom's land. You know, I'm not giving you a blank check, Israel, to do whatever you want. Just because I have chosen you and you're my people doesn't mean you can have any territory you want. I am the ultimate owner of the whole earth, and I give it to whomever I want. I'm giving you some land, and I have given the Edomites some land, and I don't want you to touch it. Be careful, Israel. Don't provoke them. Notice, as you're going to go through their land, you can't take their water. So be stealing. This is an arid region. Water would be concentrated in wells that people dig. And once you dig a well, what do you do with it? You control it. It's your water. And if other people want some, they pay for it. We see examples of this in Genesis when Abraham and Isaac fight with the, the local nations, for the wells that were dug. Everybody wants some water. The Edomites have some. Israel's traveling. They don't have any. If you want it, you've got to buy it. Food. You can't just steal the, 
food from their storehouses or from their fields or from their, their villages. You have to pay for it. But notice, you should be able to pay for it because I've been taking care of you all these years in the wilderness. Verse 7, the Lord your God has blessed you in all that you have done. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. You have not lacked a thing. So as you come to the territory of Edom, you will have things to use to exchange with the Edomites for the things that you need. Notice, God is the one who gives Edom their possession. And if he wanted to, he could take it away. But he has not chosen to do that for the Israelites. These are, this is a brother nation, and so Israel is not allowed to exterminate them, to drive them out, to kill them. It's true that in later years, during the kingdom period, there is going to be trouble with Edom. And later on, the prophets are even going to condemn Edom for rejoicing at Israel's destruction. But at this stage of the game, God says, hands off, they're a brother nation, you're not permitted to touch them. Their northern border was the Zered River here. And so crossing over moves Israel into new territory. Moves them into the territory of the Moabites. Verse 8, So we passed beyond our brothers, the sons of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from the Aravah road, away from Elat, and from Etzion Geber. We turned and passed through by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the sons of Lot as a possession. The Amim lived there formerly, a people as great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also regarded as Rephaim, but the Moabites called them Amim. So we move from one brother nation, as it were, to a cousin nation. The Moabites and the Ammonites are descendants of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. If you remember the history of these nations, they're not exactly uh, sparkling clean, right? The Moab, Moab, the eponymous ancestor of the Moabites, was the son of that gross union between Lot and his daughter. Remember that? After Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed and Mrs. Lot gets turned into a pillar of salt, Lot and his two daughters flee off and hide in some caves. And the daughters look around and realize, you know what, there are no husbands for us. What's going to happen here? Our father's name is going to be wiped out from the earth. There's dad. And the children that are born from those unions are the ancestors of the Moabites and the Ammonites. So, although those situations are uh, unattractive to say the least, they're still related to Abraham. And so God's going to bless these nations and let them have their territory and not let Israel take it away. They're not allowed to take the territory that belongs to the Moabites. Again, during the kingdom period, Moab is going to become uh, an important nation all unto itself. At various times, the Israelites are strong, for example, under David or under Solomon. And when they're strong, the first thing they do is make Edom and Moab vassal states. They don't destroy them. They make them vassal states. But at this stage of the game, Israel is the weaker party. They're coming out of Egypt, the slave nation. They're going to hide in there. They're going to sneak right across the Jordan. And God tells them, leave Moab alone. Another example of God's sovereignty when it comes to territory. Now, you might think to yourself, okay, God, why are you going... What's the big deal about not letting them have this territory? Recognize that Israel has been wandering for 40 years, and these are the first major civilizations, as it were, that they're encountering on their way to the land. What's the temptation as you head through a country that has made some major cities, major population centers? What's the temptation? The temptation is to settle down. Right? You've just come out of your, your long trek, you see population centers that, wow, that's pretty good. Why, why? This has been such a long journey. Why not stay right here? And God says, no, I'm not giving you that land. So on the one hand, there's a proscription. You're not allowed to stay here. But on the other hand, recognize God is continuing to encourage his people to move on into the better land that he has promised for them. 
How tempting would it have been to say, I'm just going to camp right here by the spring of water. Finally, fresh water and some land that we can grow a few bits of grain in. Or this one's even better, look, and a nice view of the Dead Sea. It's wonderful. Let's just camp right here. God says, no, I've got something better for you in the land. Verse 13, Moses tells them, Now arise, go over the brook Zered. So we crossed over the brook Zered. Now the time that it took for us to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the brook Zered was 38 years. Remember, they're leaving Kadesh Barnea in the second year after the Exodus, so that's 40 years. Until all the generation of the men of war perished from within the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. With the crossing over the brook Zered, we move into a new phase. Everybody else is dead of the previous generation. Notice that. Everyone else is gone. God has not yet given Israel victories on this side of the Jordan. But now we cross the Zered Brook. The men of the first generation died. And now we're about to move into a phase where God, God starts giving over Israel's enemies into their hand. He waited until that previous generation had all died. Those men, those women, were not going to experience God's deliverance, but the second generation, they will. Now they're going to start to see it. Up to this point, God's been providing for Israel, shepherding them, putting up with them. Now, in a way like he hasn't before in recent memory, he's going to start fighting for his people. And they're going to start to inherit the actual lands that he promised to them. This is very important. Notice verse 15. Moreover, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from within the camp until they all perished. Lest you think to yourself that we're just waiting around for these generations to die of natural causes and God's not involved in the killing process. This verse removes that option. These, that generation was under judgment. And God was out there I like to say it this way because I think it's true. The hand of the Lord was against them. God was actively pushing out his judgment on these people. That's how heinous that sin was. He didn't just say, fine, I'm going to leave you alone until you die. He was out there getting them and putting them down. As we move into this next phase, we're going to see Israel beating up on some of these Amorite and Canaanite nations, and people will be offended. Wow, that's really mean of the God of the Old Testament to slaughter all these Canaanites, men, women, children, sometimes the animals get it too. And they forget. When God brings judgment, he brings judgment without bias. When the Amorites sin, they're destroyed. When the Canaanites sin, they get killed. Guess what? When Israel sins, God brings the hammer too. It's not just a case of, he's mean to those Canaanites. Judgment on his own people is severe. Now, it's also mingled with mercy, and it's mingled with a remembrance of the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But notice that sentence. The hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from within the camp until they all perished. That is scary. As an Israelite, if you're hearing that, and Moses is bringing that back to your memory, oh yeah, that's why dad died. He didn't just die. God killed him and his whole generation because they refused to believe. Here we are, about to cross the Zered, about to get into battle. Guess what? I'm not going to do what dad did. I'm going to believe. God's hand was against them to kill them. Verse 16 continues, So it came about when all the men of war had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me, saying, Today you shall cross over Ar, the border of Moab. And when you come opposite the sons of Ammon, don't harass them or provoke them, for I will not give you any of the land of the sons of Ammon as a possession, for I have given it to the sons of Lot as a possession." Verse 24, however, arise, set out, and pass through the valley of Arnon. Look, I have given 
Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon, and his land into your hand, begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. This is the long-expected day. This is a huge day. The last time the, these kind of major, major victories were encountered were at the Exodus, maybe a couple of times around Moab as Israel is defending itself from people who tried to tempt them. But now, finally, the land is going to be won as a possession in battle. Now, you just lost a whole generation of fighters. You got a new generation of people who have not really been fighting. They've been, wa they've been walking. And so the question becomes, how are we going to defeat these kingdoms that have been living there for a long time? And the answer is that God is the one who's giving the land. The same God who said, I will not give you Edom, and I will not give you Moab, and I will not give you the territory of Ammon. I will give you this territory. Just as God protected these guys, he's going to hand these people over. And Israel can have confidence as they move into this battle that God will give it to them. For some reason, the illustration comes to my mind of, if you have a friend who tells the secrets of other friends, you lose confidence very quickly in that person's ability to keep your secrets secret, right? Uh, I've sometimes told people, they've asked me questions, and I say, you know what? He asked me not to say anything. And you can see it on their face. Oh, man, I'm not going to get the information that I want. And I then sometimes say to them, now listen, when it's your turn, I'll protect your secrets too. And I hope that that actually encourages the friendship and removes any sting of, oh, you're not in my inner circle, I can't tell you. No, 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 I'm protecting somebody else, and when it's your turn, I'll be just as faithful to protect you. It's interesting, in God's case, he does that with Edom and Moab and Ammon. Israel, you're not getting their land. I own it all, I give it to whoever I wish. You can have confidence that when I give you this land, I'm really going to give it to you, just like I really gave it to them. So they go into the land, and they ask, right? Arise, set out through the valley of Arnon, verse 24. and verse 25, this day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under the heavens, who, when they hear the report of you, will tremble and be in anguish because of you. So the Lord begins this battle that's coming with a disinformation campaign, right? The news goes out, Israel's coming. And you're going to get wiped out. We're going to see this with the Amorites. We're going to see it again with Jericho. Remember what Rahab tells the spies? She says, we heard about you. And we, we heard about your God and what he did. And everybody is petrified. What better way to start a war than with terrified enemies? That's what you want. And it's not Israel that's doing the terrifying. It's God working on behalf of his people. He goes in there to get them ready, to soften them up, as it were, so that when Israel finally comes through, they meet an enemy with no strength. Verse 26, So Moses, so I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemot to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will travel only on the highway. I won't turn aside to the right or to the left. You will sell me food. This sounds eerily familiar to what he said to Edom and Moab. But notice the response of the Amorites is totally different. But Sihon, verse 30, king of Heshbon, was not willing for us to pass through. Why? Why? For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate in order to deliver him into your hand as he is today. God first spreads the word, Israel's coming, and the Amorites lose heart. Second, he hardens the heart of their king. Does that sound familiar? Who else's heart did the Lord harden on purpose in order to destroy him? King Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, the Lord hardens him. Let my people go. Okay, no, I won't. And on and on and on. God just moves that man down the hill of destruction until he's right at the edge and then pushes him right over. The same thing's happening with Sihon. The Lord is hardening his heart. This is God fighting for his people. 
Then the Lord said to me, See, I have begun to deliver Sichon and his land over to you. Begin to occupy so that you may possess his land. Then Sichon, with all his people, came out to meet us in battle at Yahaz, and the Lord delivered him over to us, and we defeated him with his sons and all his people. The Lord spreads this information so that the enemies of Israel are nervous. He hardens the heart of the king. And when the battle is engaged, the Lord gives them over into the hands of Israel. Now we have seen pictures of God already in the book of Deuteronomy as merciful and loving and forgiving and willing to punish. Now we see God as a warrior. The God who fights on behalf of his people. This would be so encouraging to a slave nation that has no standing army, as it were, coming out of the wilderness, and now they see, wow, we're doing what's right, we have faith in the Lord, we obey, and He fights for us. And when the Lord fights, the Lord wins. This is going to be a problem for Israel for the rest of their history. The temptation over and over and over again for this nation will be to trust their own strength to solve their own military problems. In Deuteronomy 17, we'll get to this later in the semester, the king is actually warned, don't accumulate gold, don't accumulate horses, don't accumulate treaty wives. Many argue, myself included, that the purpose of these things would be to protect and defend the nation. You use gold to buy mercenaries and chariots and, and weapons. You use wives to arrange treaties and get protection diplomatically. You use horses to pull those chariots and defend yourself. And none of those things requires any kind of heart repentance. If you have the guns, you just shoot them. But if you're trusting in the Lord to fight for you, you've got to be doing what's right first. And I think God limits his king on purpose because he's more interested in the attitude of the heart than he is in just protecting his people. And so as Israel comes out of Egypt, they are now, that previous generation is dead. This next generation is obedient. They're doing what's right. They're following Moses in. God's going to fight for his people. And they're supposed to learn that lesson. When we do what's right, we can have confidence that God is going to fight for us. And fight he does, verse 34. So we captured all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men, women, and children of every city. We left no survivors. We took only the animals as our spoil and the spoil of the cities which we had captured. From Aror, which is on the edge of the valley Arnon, from the city which is in the valley, even to Gilead, there was no city that was too high for us. The Lord our God delivered all over to us. That statement, that verse, is a bit ironic. There was no city that was too high for us. Does that sound like anything you heard before? Isn't that what the ten spies said when they came back? These cities are fortified up to the heavens. And it turns out, that it didn't matter. Recall, if you will, the incident with the Tower of Babel, when these people are, after the flood are building this tower, that the top of which is supposed to go into the heavens. And God sort of, the text is very interesting. It, it presents God in a very anthropomorphic way. He sort of looks down and says, Oh, wow, how cute. And the Lord goes down to see the tower. I mean, if he's the God of the heavens, if he's the God that owns everything, it doesn't matter how high you build your walls at all, he can still rain something down on you. And so, there's that bit of irony. It turns out, generation that just died, no city, you guys were wrong. No city was too high for us. We captured everything, and we utterly destroyed it all. Now that's right there is a big difficulty for people when they read the Old Testament. The phrase there, translated utterly destroyed, the Hebrew word there, haram, or harem, the noun form, is, a, is difficult. It literally means to devote to the ban. That is to say, the acknowledgement that all of these things belong to God, 
by virtue of His authority as sovereign over everything that exists. And if God says it's mine, He takes it and He does whatever He wants with it. And so, sometimes that's applied to people. Sometimes that's applied to uh, livestock and possessions and clothing and gold. You remember Achan took some clothing and some, some uh, precious metals from the city of Jericho, and he was killed for that because those things belong to the Lord. They were put under the ban, is the phrase. And in this case, the ban was coming on the descendants of the Amorites because of their sinfulness. Remember what God told Abraham? He said, your people are going to go down to Egypt for 400 years because the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. That is, the devastation that's being wreaked upon these Amorite kings was judgment. God was punching the tickets of all these people. And if God wants to destroy them, it is not within the permission, it is not within the uh, possibility for Israel to spare them. They belong to God. And God says, I'm calling this one back, and you have to let it go. Remember later during Saul's day, he's going to spare one of the kings, Agag, and Samuel's going to blow a fuse. This guy was supposed to be dead. And you, Saul, to protect yourself or to make yourself look good, spared him. And the text says that Hamuel hacked Agag to death. I mean, the, the, the drama of that is huge. When God puts something under the ban as the sovereign, you can't change it. And so Israel destroys these people. We left no survivors. We took only the animals and the spoil. In this case, God said, kill the people, take the animals. You can have them. When we go to Jericho, God's going to say, don't take anything. Burn it all. It's all mine. Notice verse 37. After that first defeat of Sihon, they passed by the territory of Ammon. Only you did not go near the land of the sons of Ammon along the river Jabbok and the cities of the hill country and wherever the Lord our God had commanded us. I suggest, let me suggest to you, we're in the middle of these two Amorite battles. After the defeat of Sihon, we're next going to fight with Og, the king of Bashan. And God's going to do the same thing to him that he did to Sihon. God is starting to show himself as a warrior on behalf of Israel. This is a theme that's going to carry over as Israel crosses into the land and defeats all their enemies in the land. This side is sort of the extra they're going to defeat these people. Amorites are spread out on, in Transjordan and then in the land between as well. God is beginning to show himself to this new generation and give them a history with him to see that he will fight for them, that he will defeat their enemies, and he will bring judgment no matter how old the promise. Recognize that. The Amorites are now being punished for hundreds and hundreds of years of sin, that finally God decided, okay, now's the time. Abraham, don't worry, your people are going to go down to Egypt for 400 years, and they're going to come out because the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. Here in Deuteronomy, it's complete. That is encouraging, and at the same time, it is fear-inducing. Israel should say to themselves, wow, I have two examples of God bringing judgment like he said he would. Everybody from the first generation really died. I, I didn't think God was going to do it. But they all died. Wow. Okay. And now the Amorites are getting defeated. Wow. This is not a God to be treated lightly. He is a warrior. Hallelujah. He's on our side fighting for us. You want to keep in mind some of these terms, the origins of Edom, Moab, and Ammon, the location of these nations. As you read through these chapters, you want to have an atlas with you, either the one at the back of your Bible, which is woefully inadequate in most cases, or another atlas. Just be looking through that so you have a place for these, look, these uh, cities and these people groups. These two kings, Og of Bashan and Sihon of Heshbon. And then the concept of God as a warrior, 
the concept of holy war and the ban. I didn't use that term. Let me explain that for a moment. The term holy war doesn't refer to uh, what we usually, what, the way it's usually construed today. Usually we hear the term holy war and we think in terms of a religious inspired, a religiously motivated, extremist, fundamentalist, believe or we kill you. That's not what holy war was in the Bible. A better way to describe it is not holy war as much as it is Yahweh war. That is, God is the one who's doing the fighting. And God doesn't come in and say, repent or I'll kill you. When it comes to Yahweh war, he's bringing judgment. The, 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 these Amorites don't have an option to repent. These Amorites are being punished, as an example, of Yahweh war. You'll hear the phrase described as holy war. That it's associated with this concept of putting things under the ban. But remember, the key theme in Yahweh war, whether it's here in Deuteronomy, or in the book of Kings, or in the book of Chronicles, is simply this. God is the one who's fighting on behalf of Israel. Let me suggest to you that the same God who fights for Israel is the God who fights on our behalf today. It's the same God who defeated the biggest enemy that we have. Sin and death we could not conquer. We, like those Israelites, look at that problem and say, it's fortified up to the heavens. And God comes in and with the sacrifice of his son defeats sin for us. And yes, like these Israelites, they had work to do. They had to actually go out and kill those Amorites. They have to actually go out and, and, and destroy those things. And we have to continue to fight to eradicate sin in our lives. But the battle has been won, not because of our strength, but because of the one who fought for us. It reminds us that we have a great God who is a great warrior on our behalf. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for fighting for us. As we see you fighting for Israel, our, our, our delight in you, our awe of you just continues to grow. You promised your people that you would work for them. You promised your people that you would fight for them. And we see you fulfilling your promises. And it gives us confidence that you will fulfill the greatest promise you've made to us, that one day we will be with you forever in heaven. Give us great faith, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.